Welcome to the smartest people in the room. We are glad you are here and just by showing up, you're already demonstrating your very own smarts. Today, I am pleased to present two people who have launched a new investment vehicle that I bet you've never heard about. And I promise you will leave today thinking, wow, who knew you'll leave smarter and more inspired and hopefully even more wealthy than you arrived. Before we begin, let me take care of some business. First, to the audience, please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat window. The reason we do these webinars is twofold. First, we wanna showcase really smart people and the amazing work they do day to day in the entertainment industry. But the second reason is a bit more nuanced. Many of you know that I am a music industry headhunter. I run the music practice at Turnkey ZRG and I place music executives in roles throughout the industry. So by definition and function, I help people connect with companies. In this series, my goal is to help you make more connections and I invite you to take full advantage of that opportunity. Specifically, I invite you to engage with the speakers and the other attendees in the chat of the Zoom. Please introduce yourselves, share your LinkedIn profile, say hello to your friends and make some new ones and ask questions of our speakers. We will try to address as many of those as possible during the session. Also, please make sure your chat is set to address everyone, not just the host and speakers. I wanna thank our program sponsors for without their support, we could not keep this series free. Special thanks to First Horizon Bank, Turnkey ZRG, the Tennessee Entertainment Commission, MedJet, Tennessee Brew Works, Project Music, and Better Than Booze. So let's get down to business. In today's host seat, we welcome Jane Edmondson. Co-founder of EQM Indexes LLC, Jane is a former quanti quantitative portfolio manager with Alliance Global Investors and its predecessor firm, Nicholas Applegate. She started her career with Merrill Lynch and has more than 30 years of experience in the investment industry. EQM Indexes is an industry leader in the area of thematic and bespoke index design. EQM's indexes are licensed in the US, Europe, and Australia spanning themes such as music, online retail, blockchain, EM fintech, and solar, lithium, and battery technology, and rare earths critical materials, which are essential for the transition to green energy. EQM also has a suite of income indexes focused on high yielding alternatives. Welcome, Jane. It is a pleasure to have you on the, on the show. Thank you, Tom. It's a pleasure being here. And joining Jane as today's featured guest is David Shuloff. David is an American music industry executive and investor with 25 years of experience in the field. Most recently, he's developed the MSU, MS, <laughs> MUSQ Global Music Industry ETF, which is traded on the New York Stock Exchange under the symbol MUSQ. It's a cost it's a cutting edge fund designed to offer investors a pure play exposure to the global music industry. David's background in the music industry is extensive, having previously served as president of music publishing at Live One, a global media company for live stream and on-demand audio, video, and podcast content. He's also the former president of music at AGC Studios and IM Global Studios, and was one and was the co-founder and CEO of Evergreen Copyrights, where he pursued a global acquisition strategy of music publishing catalogs and built one of the largest independent music companies worldwide, which eventually was sold to BMG Rights Management. David received a BA from Georgetown University and a JD from the NYU School of Law. He's a member of the New York State Bar. It is my pleasure to welcome these two rock stars to our platform today. Take it away, guys. Okay, Thank David, you. I'm gonna get us started here. Um, yeah. So Tom gave you a great intro. You've been in the music industry for a number of years. Um, I'm, I'm curious, how did you become so passionate about music? And how did you end up in the in the music industry? And maybe you can give us just a little bit more about your background and some of your experiences that you've had in the industry. Yeah. So thank you, Jane. And thank you, Tom, for that nice introduction. Um, so uh, I have been in the industry for a long time, for 25 years. Uh, music's always been sort of the thread of everything that I've done. Um after graduating from Georgetown University, I was uh, I was offered a job working at Interscope Records. That was my first my first job working for Jimmy Iovine, uh, who started Interscope. Uh, 
after Interscope, I went back to New York, went to law school, um, went, went to NYU. Uh, I really wanted to get into the entertainment business. And um, after I graduated from NYU, I was offered a job by uh, Scott Greenstein, who today is like the second in command at Sirius Radio. He was at, he was working at the Weinstein Company or what was then Miramax Films. And um, I was the uh, I was the music attorney for for Disney overseeing Miramax and Dimension. And after working there for seven years, I decided to go off and become an entrepreneur. And um, my first, you know, company that I raised capital for was a company called Evergreen. That was back in 2005 um, and uh, raised money from Lehman Brothers, raised one hundred million dollars of financing and went off to pursue a roll up of of companies. We bought Ryko Music. We bought. J.J. Kale, which wrote songs for Eric Clapton. We did deals with Teddy Riley, with Todd Rundgren. It was a pretty amazing company. Bought a company called ICG. We had Liz Rose was one of our writers. We had Taylor Swift's first album that we were administering, Seals and Crofts, and lots of other. We had offices in Nashville, L.A., New York, and London. Um, so I built up that company and sold that company to KKR. It became BMG Rights Management. Uh, and then real, and then became the president of a, of a film studio at I Am Global. Started producing some movies. Went off and produced Clive Davis's film, the soundtrack of our lives, which we sold to Apple. We financed that. I produced that. Sold it to uh, to Apple, which today is a number one music doc on Netflix. And then, as you pointed out, I was been the president of music at um at Live One for the last four years, overseeing all of their m music publishing, Podcast One, and Slacker Radio. And then, um, so that's kind of my background, um, you know, around public and private companies, all kind of centered around kind of music. Um, and I guess kind of maybe a year ago, um, from like right now, I was thinking about what to do next. Um, and uh, and there were so many publishing companies out there. Um, and when I was, you know, when I started Evergreen in 2005, there wasn't nearly the competition that we have today Today you have some amazing companies like Reservoir and, and Round Hill and um, you know so many great companies. Cobalt just you can't compete today in the publishing world. So I had to come up with something different. I had to devise something different. And so, cut to here we are. Yeah. You know, with, so with MUSQ. Yeah, I think you reached out to us about a year ago about this idea that you had to create um, a mu basically a a music index that would have every aspect of the global music industry in it. And it, you know, it was obviously a fascinating idea. Um, I guess you took some of your financial background and kind of married that to music, but how did it, so this, how did it come, come ahead, come about in your mind that this was something that you wanted to do to actually build an investment product? Yeah. So, um, you know, so look, so investing in music, has always been very illiquid for me. You know, I was an investor in a bunch of different funds. I got an investor in labels, publishing companies, and that was very illiquid capital. Um, so it was, you know, music was sort of an illiquid alternative to investing. And what I wanted to do was create a liquid alternative. I really wanted an opportunity for investors. First of all, to be invested as an investor in music, you have to be a qualified investor. OK, so if you want to be an LP at Blackstone or KKR or Apollo or Providence, and I can give you a long list of other private, you got to show net assets of whatever it is. Right. Three million, five million dollars. A lot of people don't have that. So it immediately kind of ostracized sort of the self-directed Robin Hood investor that wanted to invest a thousand dollars or two thousand or ten thousand or a hundred thousand. So first I wanted to democratize the process of music investing. I wanted to make music available to the masses, number one. Number two, I had to figure out a platform that was liquid for them to do that, where they wouldn't have to fill out paperwork and show net assets. And so I kind of looked at the public markets. And what I realized, like over the last, you know, seven or eight years, you have some amazing music companies that are all public today. And I started to, and this is a year ago, I kind of began to build a portfolio of what I thought would be an amazing opportunity to get total exposure to the global music industry. So I took out a piece of paper and I'm like, wait a second, there's 10 streaming companies. Amazing. Wait a minute. There's like 25 content um, labels and music publishing companies. Amazing. Wait, how many radio companies? Amazing. How many concert promoters and ticketing companies? Amazing. How many equipment technology? So what I, after designing 
kind of first, I just had this list of companies. And then I said, you know what? Okay, now we need to make this formal and regulated if we're going to take it public. And that's when I started investigating and doing some more research into the ETF business. And so what I realized was there was no music ETF. And for and for the audience that may or may not know what an ETF is, it's it's fairly straightforward. An ETF is an exchange traded fund, which is basically a basket of securities you buy or sell through a brokerage firm or a stock exchange. They're, they're similar to mutual funds, but unlike mutual funds and more similar to a stock, they can be traded whenever the market's open. So what they do is these ETFs, and there's like 4,000 of them today, uh, they basically allow investors to, to achieve diversification by investing in, in a portfolio of securities. So when you think about the triple Qs, you know, those are, you know, very tech heavy ETF. That's a very tech heavy ETF. Um, you have the SPIES, which is an index fund for the, you know, for the top, you know, Fortune 500 companies. Um, and so what's, what kind of, what MUSQ is, okay, just to kind of get down to, to it, MUSQ, the name of the fund is the MUSQ Global Music Industry ETF. And what that is, it is the first pure play opportunity for all investors worldwide to invest in the global music industry. And the way that is set up is it's really five different buckets of, um, of, of securities, okay? So you have uh, streaming, right? And there are, so there's, there's a total, first of all, of 47 uh, securities on our index. And for those that are online right now, you can quickly jump to our website if you want, and you can go look at musq.com. And if you pull up, there's a fact sheet there. Well, first on the homepage, you'll see all of the, uh, all, all the securities there. You'll see our top holdings. And then if you scroll through later on, you can download our fact sheet. Um, you can download the white paper, which Jane and I wrote. You could download the investment case and there's a pitch deck. But just to kind of summarize what MUSQ is, it's really 47 companies. OK, these are all music companies divided, uh, defined by five different categories. So you have streaming and there are 11 companies on that index today. Um, you have uh, content and distribution, and there's about 20 companies in that bucket. You have live music and ticketing. And there's, I think, five or six companies in that bucket. You have music equipment and technology. There's, I think, 10 companies in that bucket. And then there's music uh, there's music equipment and technology. There's live music and ticketing. There's streaming. There's content. And then there's radio. And uh, and there's radio. And so, uh, you know, those are, those are companies that are all um, music companies. And the way that we've defined music is each of these companies has to generate more than 50% of the revenues from music, or they have to be a top five player or control more than 10% global market share in any of those five categories I mentioned. So the companies can be no less than $100 million in market cap. Um, they have to have average daily trading liquidity of at least $500,000 a day, and they go up from there. Uh, no single company can be greater than 7% on the index. Otherwise, you know, we have some of the big streaming companies on there like Apple, Amazon, and Google. And naturally, if they, if it was all market cap weighted, they would outweigh the index. So those companies can never be more than 7% on the index. So what you have is a really nice blend of music and technology across the entire uh, music industry ecosystem. 45% of these companies are domestic companies. 55% of the companies are foreign companies. Um, so on the streaming side, you have obviously companies like uh, Spotify, you have Google, you have Amazon, you have Apple, you've got companies in Korea, like Genie Music Corp and Kakao, you've got Click Digital, which is uh, in the Great Britain, and then you've got uh, Tencent, and you have Cloud Music, so you really have a nice mix of streaming companies, content companies, you have obviously the very big names that everybody on this on this call is familiar with like Warner Music Group and Universal, um, but you also have eight K-pop companies. You've got companies in Japan like Amuse and Avex. You've got companies in France like Believe. You have companies in Taiwan like Him International. You have the smaller publishing royalty trusts like uh, Hypnosis, Reservoir, um, Roundhill. Um, 
and you have you know the big company and you have big companies like Sony and and Stream Media Corp. So a really broad, diversified portfolio of content and distribution companies on the live music side. You've got uh, you know big names like uh, Live Nation and Madison Square Garden, and you've got companies internationally like CTS Eventum and Vivid Seats, and then uh, music equipment technology. You know, consists of companies like Avid, Bang & Olufsen, Dolby, Rollin Corp, really all the tools that artists use in the studio. So we're really trying to give, and then lastly, just not to omit the last category on radio, you have obviously Sirius Radio and iHeart, and then other companies like Southern Cross Media in Australia, Town Square Media. Mm-hmm. So the whole point of this thing, I think you see, is really to give investors an opportunity to invest globally in music. If you believe that music is a good investment and we have strong data to support that it's a very good investment, this is a great way for investors to get exposure to music. You shouldn't have to just pick Universal or Warner Music Group. Why would you bet on Taylor Swift at Universal if you've, you know, Bruno Mars is signed to Warner Music Group, right? So you've got, don't bet on one, bet on everything, bet on every aspect of the industry. Uh, It's uh, exposure to domestic and foreign companies. It's very hard, by the way, to get exposure to a lot of these foreign companies. As an individual investor, you can't just uh, go invest in a lot of these Korean companies. You have to go set up local accounts and trade them locally. It's hard. And so um, this ETF well, really... Yeah. Well, ETF I mean, the timing, timing could not be more perfect um, as far as the launch of this. Because I think everybody knows, you know, this summer has been sort of the summer of concerts, right? So live music post the pandemic, we've got Taylor Swift with her billion dollar tour. You've got Beyonce, Springsteen, um, you know, and that's in the live music segment. Um, so when, when did the, the ETF launch? The actual date was, uh, it's been so about- the actual day, Yeah, it was a couple of days after July 4th. That Friday, right. July 7th was the soft launch. We um, So it's only been around for about a month. Uh, we had we rang the bell the New York Stock Exchange on uh, on yep. Thursday. That was super 15th. fun, yeah. It was an amazing time. They, uh, you know, showed us a tremendous hospitality. Uh, and uh, it's, um, you know, it's it, it's an exciting time to to come out with this product. Absolutely. Now, and then besides uh, live- Live music, you know, obviously there's been a huge resurgent there. Um, in fact, I've, I'm scheduled to go to a few concerts myself. Uh, I've got Coldplay and Sting coming up. So people are definitely going back to to uh, live concerts. But let's talk a little bit about streaming. Um, yeah. You shared some of the companies in this category. But one of the controversies right now is that all these streaming companies are raising their prices. What are your yeah. thoughts there? Why are they doing it? And how is it going to trickle down to the artists? Well, well, okay, all great questions. And and that's why our industry is positioned for explosive growth. And I'll tell you what I mean by that right now. First of all, JP Morgan called music the most undermonetized uh, business in the media industry today. Think about this, right? If you step back, ask any, my daughter knows that paying $10 a month or now $11 a month and accessing 150 million songs is a pretty damn good deal compared to what she has to pay for Disney or what she's paying for, you know, Netflix or any of these other services. So it's very um, it's it's a cheap value proposition. Um, music streaming, first of all, just raised their rates for the first time. OK, in like the last 15 years. OK, um, let me put that in context. So Spotify has almost 200 million paid subscribers. They raised that by a dollar. Right. That's two and a half billion dollars of incremental revenue uh, to that company alone. Apple, Amazon and YouTube collectively, that's another 200 million users. Right there. They also just raised the rates by a dollar. Right. So that's another two and a half billion dollars. So that's five billion dollars of incremental revenue. Um, The industry is is expected to reach, I think, one hundred and thirty billion dollars in the next 10 years. Um, okay. uh, streaming, st- streaming alone. Okay. Um, and, and it just, we're just scratching the surface. I think Jane with price hikes right now, um, you know, all of these other streaming companies out there, um, that are streaming media are, you know, charging a lot more. So I think streaming is, is about to go through, uh, another round of price hikes. I know they're getting 
I know Robert Kinsel, the new CEO of Warner Music Group, is doing an amazing job, is putting pressure on the streaming companies to raise their rates. So what does that do for the content companies? They're direct recipients of that money, right? And their, in their content uh, agreements with all of the streamers, they get paid a, a percentage of the total content cost. So as the rates go up, they benefit. So what you're going to see is you're going to see incremental revenue to the streamers over the next five years, 10 years. You're going to see incremental revenue to all of the label owners. You're going to see incremental revenue to the publishing companies. And the beauty about all this stuff is that none of it's correlated to advertising. It's all paid. It's all subscription. So this whole our whole business is not is not correlated. Our whole business uh, is really around paid subscriptions. So streaming is hot. It's red hot. I think I think we're 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 in we're in for a nice ride. Like JP Morgan, what else did I read? Or the uh sorry, Goldman Sachs put out their report. Yeah. It's going it's growing to like uh it's double it's going to the whole industry is going to double in revenue. I forget the numbers that they gave, Jane, in the next seven years. So when you add up streaming, when you add up uh content from music labels and publishers, and then we haven't even talked about live music and ticketing. But the whole industry is uh, is really is red hot right now and on fire. And I and that was the whole point of this thing was to kind of capture the growth and innovation around music and give investors a completely liquid opportunity to get into this business at any time. Right. And, 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 and hang on for the ride and you can get out whenever you want and get back in whenever you want. But give investors an opportunity to participate in this growth and innovation that's happening right now in, in the whole global music industry. Yeah, it's really an exciting investment theme. One of the other things that we talked about in the white paper um, that's really interesting is how artists now are monetizing their content. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of artists like Neil Diamond, uh, I know Queen is, is shopping their catalog. Um, they're trying to monetize their IP. And there's these uh, royalty trusts um, that investors, I, I know that they're in the index and the ETF. Can you talk a little bit about that? and how, you know, that's a big change that's occurring in the industry as well. Yeah. So look, you're hundred uh, percent right. Like it's hard to pick up a newspaper or, you know, read a periodical without seeing some new artist selling their catalog for 25 times or 20 times. Uh, so publishing is, is obviously exciting uh, artists and are, are excited by it by, for whatever reason, capital gains treatment, or I think there was a lot of cheap capital out there as well. Um, but music publishing has always been an, a, a, good, a great, stable asset to own. I've been a music publisher now for 25 years. And so, but what's exciting to your point, Jane, is that you have so many great music publishing companies out there now. So you have all the majors that are on the, that are on, that are part of the MUSQ Global Fund, right? You have Universal, you have Sony, you have Warner Music Group. Now you have all the royalty trusts, right? Which are like Round Hill, you have Reservoir. Um, you have hypnosis, but now you also have all these other companies that are entering the mix. So a company like Hybe, it's technically a Korean company. Hybe now they bought uh, quality control, right? They bought uh, you know a large piece of uh, the management company behind you know Ariana Grande and uh, and Justin Bieber. You know, so they're like in the management business, they're in the publishing business. So there's just um, a lot of music publishing that's being sold today. And we want to capture, we want to be, oh, we want investors to get exposure to all this too. I'm, you know, they're just reading about it and now they can actually participate in it. If they think that publishing is a good business, well, then you go in and you buy shares in MUSQ. You're getting exposure to, you know, 10, 12, 14 different companies that are, otherwise they can't get exposure to more, to music publishing. I mean, they could pick one, but, you know, but, you know, Reservoir, and Round Hill and Hypnosis, right? They're all like kind of different, right? A Ground Hill might be focused a little bit more on indie rock or alternative rock. You know, Reservoir might be focused a little bit more on hip hop. Uh, Hypnosis might be focused more on heritage rock. Don't pick one. You should own shares in all these companies because they're all they're all run by amazing CEOs. They're all buying stellar catalogs and just get exposure to all them and get exposure to everything else that all the majors are doing too. Get exposure to Taylor Swift's publishing, get exposure to, you get the idea. So the, opp the opportunity here is to get exposure to everything. Uh, and it's hard to, it's really hard to just pick one company, right? Uh, honestly, for, for a lay investor, right? Um, 
And I think this product's for very sophisticated investors, but it's just for lay investors who just love music. And they're just like, wait a second, cat. Wait, Taylor Swift's tour is I just read something. She's doing like a billion three in revenue. Wait, the economy's up four billion. Like, what does that mean? Like, they they don't really know. They don't know how to study that. I mean, they may find that she signed to Republic and Republic's owned by Universal, but that's like complicated, right? Like, get on her bandwagon. Live Nation's her promoter. That's on the index. Universal's a big chunk of the, you know, I forget what does Universal have? Uh you know, where are they? They're like uh, 2.7% of the index. Like she's streaming, you know, on Spotify, on Sirius. Like there's all this like wind, there's all these tailwinds from the tail, you know, the Taylor tailwinds are are taking effect. And and this index is, is capturing that. So that's the whole, that's really the whole point. Get into the zeitgeist of music. If you love the whole thing about what's going on with these tours, you love Beyonce, you love, um, Look at all the amazing tours that went on this summer. God, I mean, yeah. between, between Beyonce and Taylor and Elton John and uh, Harry Styles and uh, Ed Sheeran and then the Red Hot Chili Peppers, like like uh, amazing tours are happening. And and this index is capturing a lot of that growth from it. Well, I think you, you've touched on something. I mean, people are paying a lot to go to these live concerts and they're willing to do it um, because, you know, we've been kind of, you know, locked locked in our houses for the last three years. Um, let's talk to a little bit about K-pop as a phenomenon. And uh, there's a lot of K-pop um, companies in the index and ETF as well. This truly is kind of a, a global uh, portfolio. And, you know, those Korean companies, you can't get access to those um, really, you know, as a U.S. investor, unless it is in this ETF, correct? Uh, that's correct. I mean, you have to set up kind of local accounts. You have to, uh, it's really hard to kind of get exposure to um, uh, to a lot of these companies. Uh, you can't, you can't trade them. You have to set up local accounts uh, and we're, we're kind of, we're really simplifying that process. Yes. So we talked about, okay, so we've got some, some really big trends and, and part of what we do um, is try to identify, you know, disruptive trends and then turn them into investment products. And so we've helped you do that in this case. But we've got the trends in live music. Obviously, we just talked about all these big tours and people really are willing to, to spend money on concerts. I think the Taylor Swift concert tickets going for like about $1,000 each. I mean, it's crazy. Um, now, I think Ticketmaster and, and Live Nation are getting maybe a little bit of pushback on that. And there could be some regulation coming in. Do you have some thoughts there? Yeah, well, look, there's like, there, there, you know, look, there is inflation. I mean, tickets are more expensive, right? Just generally speaking, but I don't think it's fair to say that Taylor Swift prices are a thousand dollars. What you have, which is a bigger problem, you have, you, you have, um, you have bots, you have robots today that are basically buying tickets and arbitraging them. It's across the board. It's happening with Springsteen. It's happening with Taylor Swift. Everybody on this webinar knows that. So uh, that's an issue that I think, you know, some of the bigger ticketing companies like Live Nation, which controls, or some of the, I should say the promoters like Live Nation, which also own the ticketing companies, those are issues that they need to deal with, right? Because they're in control there. And they're actually under, they're actually under some scrutiny right now to get a hold of that. But that that is an issue, right? With 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 technology today, the way things are, like bots shouldn't be stealing tickets from kids who want to buy them at face value. It just doesn't feel right. And so they need to invest and figure out ways to protect the kids so they can afford. Those are the re real Taylor fans, right? They're, they're, they're not, they're, they're not the uh, robots that are buying and trading them for a thousand dollars. So we got to do something about that. Well, I think everybody's a Taylor fan these days. It seems that way. Um, so we've got live music, you know, huge growth there. We've got, we talked about content and distribution. We talked about streaming, the, the huge growth there. Um, over the next you know, five to 10 years, what, how, where do you expect the industry to go? I know one of the new hot topics right now is artificial intelligence. How is that gonna get integrated into the music industry? And is it a, is it a good thing for music? Or, I mean, AI always has some controversy. So I wanted to get your, your thoughts there. Yeah. No, look, AI always has controversy. And I think uh, it, it's really relevant today. Look, everyone's concerned about not only uh, everyone's concerned about piracy, everyone's concerned about um, what what robots can do. Right. I think we saw what happened with fake the fake way fake Drake and the fake fake weekend. 
Um, but you know, when that happened, like Universal sent the takedown notice right away and it was gone. Right. So I think they're pretty litigious about protecting that. Um, you know, look, there, there's always the risk of piracy when you have AI, but I think we need to look at the, the benefits of AI, right? Artists and producers now have access to stems to create like amazing recordings. Paul McCartney just did that with John Lennon. Um, you know, producers and writers are able to, you know, do, you know, accomplish great things with AI. So, uh, you know, I think that, I think the benefits of AI uh, are, are exceed kind of the risks of it. There's always the threat with technological change. I mean, it did, it happened in 2003, right? When, when Napster came around, but, you know, um, so piracy is always an issue whenever you have technological change, but I, I feel like, uh, what did I read the other day? I think Google is now creating a legitimate service of AI tracks with with Universal. So there's going to be there's going to be some regulation around this. It's going to be hard, I think, and I think the benefit of that uh, is going to be great. I mean, artists today. I read somewhere else that artists are uploading anywhere from a hundred to one hundred and fifty thousand new songs a day. I mean, so you're going to see a lot of prolific uh artists you know some good not so good but you're going to see a lot of music around that um it's going to make labels by the way even more valuable and more important because they're going to need to curate this but it's really going to democratize democratize the uh, process around creating music kids will be able to do it on their phone they'll be able to upload songs to tiktok or whatever um but you know but look a true artist is going to have to write a true artist is going to have to create stories a real artist is going to have to go on tour and that's where they get fans that buy tickets so this whole notion of uh you know ai replacing you know human beings and the threat of of a fake artist like i i just don't believe it i think it'll be there but it'll never artists are are there to tell stories about their communities whether it's you know r&b or rock or country and AI can never, you know, replace that. And so I think ultimately, I think they're just tools that'll help these artists deliver their stories. Yeah, and it's interesting because some of the music companies, even though they're like, you know, they're worried about AI, they're also investing in it as well. So that's kind of a, a you know, something that's going on. So, you know, I think it's it's here to stay. It's just how it's going to get integrated into the music industry. And then, you know, hopefully it will flow down to, to the artists themselves. Yes, ag ag agreed. Um, so David, um, I'm just going to do like a quick tutorial about ETF. You talked about the ETF structure, but I know a lot of our the people probably listening right now are not necessarily, you know, investment advisors. So let's talk about some of the cool aspects of, of an ETF and why it would be attractive. So ETFs trade on a stock exchange. So MUSQ trades on the New York stock exchange, and you can buy it anytime, you know, during, uh, market hours. Um, so even though a lot of the companies within the ETF, the basket of stocks, are trading, you know, different hours um, on the on different exchanges, um, you an investor can invest um, intraday um, in in these companies in an ETF format. And the cool thing about ETFs too is that um, you mentioned, you know, it's, it's kind of a democratic process. Um, the ETFs trading at around twenty four dollars a share right now. So I mean, literally. If you're an investor, you could buy one share of MUSQ. Obviously, you wouldn't, you know, it doesn't give you a huge amount of exposure, but, you know, that's an option. Um, so there's no uh, investment thresholds. There's no uh, minimums that you have to meet. I mean, you can literally buy um, as much as or as little as one share of MUSQ. Um, the other nice aspect about ETFs is that they're diversified. So you mentioned there's almost 50 names in here. So it's a basket of companies. Uh, we've done a really good job, I think, of weighting it so that it's very liquid and you know gives people exposure to the theme um, without moving the price of these, these uh, stocks too much. Um, so that's another aspect uh, that's nice about ETFs as well. And then finally, the tax efficiency. These, I mean, I would expect that these companies are gonna grow, generate a lot of capital gains. And so another aspect that's nice about ETFs is that you don't pay, you know, for the most part, most ETFs do not generate capital gains. And so you can have these companies grow in your portfolio without a big tax bill. So those are kind of, you know, some, some nice aspects about ETFs. And I'm sure, David, these were all things that you were thinking about 
when you thought about what the best structure was for this MUSQ um, ETF. Is that correct? Yeah, no, I wanted some, I wanted it to be completely liquid. I wanted it to be tax advantageous. I wanted it to be able to trade. Uh, and, you know, uh, any investor today can invest ten dollars. They can invest, well, it'd be a minimum of $25 or $24 at the close right. today. Uh, but they can buy one share and they can buy as many shares that they as they want. Um, maybe talk a little bit. Um, we talked about the holdings. We talked about the geographic segments. Um, yeah, if there's what, new companies that come available, like IPOs, um, would they be eligible for inclusion right away? I, I think the way we've got it written is that they could come in if they were met all the other criteria, correct? Yeah, if they met all the other criteria, they would they would come in, and if they didn't meet the criteria, they get knocked off. Uh, I think I mentioned average daily trading liquidity of five hundred thousand dollars a day. If they're between two to five hundred thousand, uh, they get a half weight. So all the companies are market cap weighted. If they're believe, between two to five hundred thousand, they actually get a half weight. So you could see some very small companies on there with a tiny interest uh, if they're if they meet the minimum threshold. Uh, and if not, they get kicked off. The index, by by the way, gets rebalanced quarterly. I'm not sure if, if we mentioned that. So every quarter, uh, uh, there, there's a rebalancing that happens. And if you'll you'll see the companies, some of them uh, may go off and some new ones may come on. I think there's a new K-pop company, Jane, I saw that went on called Rainbow. I have to actually look at that a little more. But I think that when that was recently on, uh, and I think we lost one or two companies too. So it's fluid. Uh, and it's really, again, we want this to be liquid, so anybody can invest any amount of money into the ETF. Um, you know, if we look uh, in the last three weeks, it looks like we had ten million dollars of inflows into the fund. So it looks like investors are pretty pretty excited about it. Yeah, that's um, great for for one month out of the shoot. That's that's really good. I mean, obviously, this is really resonating with investors. Um, you know, because I mean, everybody loves music, right? Um, and I think people do recognize that the music industry really is a business. It's a disruptive business. And, you know, all the publicity that, that it's getting right now with, with these big tours and then, you know, what's going on with streaming and all the great content out there. Um, I mean, the timing just seems to be perfect. You're kind of getting in, um, you know, it, kind of into an early stage here of, of some pretty rapid growth. Yeah, I think we're capturing the growth and innovation of the industry really well with this um, with this ETF right now. And, you know, I've read like the Luminate report that just came out. What did I read? One trillion streams uh, yeah. in, in the last three months it's alone. Yeah. Yeah. So streaming is just is just exploding. Uh, we talked about price hikes. I think we're going to see more price hikes down the road. Certainly a lot of pressure from the labels on the streamers to do that. And they control the content, by the way. So if they're not happy with uh, with the way these streaming companies are, um, you know, performing, uh, you know, they can always withhold their content. Uh, so I think the content companies are in, are in a pretty good position to demand price hikes. And and Robert Kinsel uh, from Warner Music Group was pretty vocal about that recently. <clears throat> okay, Dave, I'm getting a little um, personal here. What, yeah. I know you're a music lover. Who are yeah. your favorite artists, your favorite genres of music? You know, I shared, I, I'm going to be, I've got tickets to Coldplay in September and Sting in October. Who are the some of your favorite artists and genres? Yeah, you know, look, I'm a singer songwriter myself, so I grew up listening to you know Neil Young and Springsteen and all that sort of stuff. So I'm pretty. Uh, that's the kind of stuff I enjoy listening to. I have a 13 year old daughter who is all over TikTok, so she educates me, you know, around kind of all the new pop pop stuff. But uh, but I'm kind of an old soul, and I love R and B and. I think you told me too well. that you're a country music fan. Is that right? Yeah, I do. Love, I do love country. I do. Uh, I think they write some of the best songs. So. I did spend a lot of time in Nashville and uh, what an amazing, amazing community of, of songwriters there. And uh, yeah, well, I, you know, I, I want to do something down there. Maybe we'll, maybe you'll help me, Jay. Maybe we'll do like an MUSQ conference and we'll do it in Nashville. Maybe we'll invite like a bunch of CEOs or artists to come perform. And I think we should do it in Nashville. That's where I'd like to do it. And kind yeah, of, uh, that we should do really it together. Fun. Yeah, actually we do have a conference coming up in September um there's in Huntington Beach there's a big uh, financial conference called Future Proof um yeah we have a yeah yeah that's fun, that's fun. There and, and yeah, so it's gonna be live music 
So it, it should be. Yeah, we have Method Man and Red playing there. Yeah, that'll be fun. So uh, Future Proof is a big wealth conference. Uh, some of you may or may not be familiar with Huntington Beach. I'll be speaking there on um, Wednesday. I think my panel's at Wednesday on um on Wednesday morning, and the the topic is uh is all is September, about thematic September thirteenth, right? Yeah, yeah, Wednesday, September thirteenth. Uh, and the topic there is all about thematic uh th thematic ETFs, and so MUSQ is a thematic ETF, just like Chat C H A T on generative AI, M E T V Metaverse Bets, Weed, Video Games, Jets, Cruises. So those are all thematic funds. So I think we're talking about. Uh, thematic funds on that day, but I'll be speaking at Future Proof. Um, what else can I? What else can I say, Jane? Uh, you know, I kind of, you know, I'm really excited about what we're doing with this. I think this is a win for just anybody who loves music. Um, and uh, you can follow me on LinkedIn uh, if if folks want to do that. I kind of write about stuff every day. Write about all the companies on our index. Um, uh, write about all the exciting things happening, uh, you know, with, with all the public companies on our index. Um, what else, Jane, what else can we talk about? Well, I'm looking at some of the questions in the chat and yeah, let's look, all right, let's do that the, right now. Some of yeah. the things that have come up is yeah. uh, we're talking about the, the big majors and, you know, how they're adapting to some of these changes. Um, you know, from your perspective, you know, looking at the, the list of companies that are in the index and the ETF, what are some of the ones that you're most excited about that you really well, think look, are great companies? Well, I mean, there's a lot. Think, but... Well, well, first of all, all the content companies I'm excited about. If you look like when they just reported earnings, they're all up by like nine to 22%, right? So they're all benefiting from all the streaming that's taking place. I'm really excited about all these content companies, all the K-pop companies, JYP, SM Entertainment, Hybe, uh, they all had revenue increases increases by like 80% the last quarter, right? And their stock was up like 50%. So these K-pop companies, I think, are on fire right now. Uh, they have, mat you know, again, they're and they're entering the U.S. business, which is why they're growing so quickly. So I'm really excited about all them. Um, I'm just excited Tencent overall. Music. Yeah, Tencent Music just reported yesterday. They had great earnings, uh, which is really interesting in the context of, some of the issues that are going on in China, you know, consumers are still streaming music. Um, so what did I what did I see? I saw like they had like 90 million or 100 million paid users. I think I read that. So, you know, you just have like people are just signing up and paying for music because it's a it's a great value proposition. I'm not even sure what Tencent Music is charging. I know everybody else is charging eleven dollars. Uh, and maybe they pull it together in some family plan, but everyone is paying is paying for music, and I think I think that's really that's an exciting part of the opportunity. Yeah, um, you mentioned TikTok. Your daughter is a TikTok fan. Yeah. Um, I see a lot of transformation going on. That you know, it's not just how how video is also integrating with music. Um, you know, obviously TikTok talk is not in the portfolio because it's not a U.S. publicly traded company, but um, do you, do you envision that music and video and all these different art forms are going to come together? Um, continue? yeah, well, it is, it, it, it is coming together. Yeah. I mean, I mean, TikTok really is the first, uh, massive social media streaming company, uh, that it's already right. Where is it? It's in Mexico, it's in Singapore, uh, and they're entering the U S market. Now they just did a deal, I think with WMG and they licensed the entire catalog from WMG. So WMG knows that they need TikTok for their audience to develop and break new acts. So they're discover they're using TikTok to discover new music and they're using TikTok to promote new releases, right? Because that's where the audience is and that's where the kids are. When you look at the industry today, Gen Z and millennials are driving the industry today. They're the ones that are buying, that are paying for streaming services. They're the, they're the ones that are gobbling up music tickets. Right. They're not old, you know, white guys like me who love Springsteen. Like right? they're like young kids that are out there today gobbling up music. And so that's the audience today. And that's why Warners was really smart to, um, you know, to do a deal with them. And so I think uh, they're going to they already are in the U.S. market. They're going to go public. Um, and when they do, I'm sure they'll quickly be eligible to be on this index. And so we'll capture that 
will capture that growth and that innovation when they when they if and when they do go public. Yeah, you you raise an interesting point because there is kind of a diversification by demographic element here as well. So you've got the sort of the young kids that are um, you know streaming hip hop music. You get older folks like us that are buying vinyl. Um, there's been this resurgence of vinyl the last few years, and actually some of the younger kids are getting into that as well. But it's it you know music really it is a really a broad broadly diversified by demographic as well. Well, you mentioned vinyl. Do you know what the number one selling piece of vinyl was this year from which artist? I don't, but you it was do. Taylor, it, was, it, was, it was, I study, I mean, I study this every day. It's Taylor <laughs> Swift. The Swifties. Okay, so people are buying, Those are the fans. The They're buying, buying vinyl. vinyl. Yeah. You would never think like a Swifty fan who's like, I don't know what the demographic is. It's probably between a 12 to 20 year old, you know, girl probably is probably right in the sweet spot of a Swifty yeah. fan. Right. And they're buying vinyl. So it just shows you like these are super fans, by the way. And that's what's going on. So I think uh, artist fan engagement is what we're seeing right now between vinyl and NFTs. Um, this is all part of fandom. Right. And and fans know that artists make a lot more money on vinyl than on a stream. They also prefer the sound. Vinyl sales are up 22 percent. They want to pay for premium products. They don't mind overpaying. That shows kind of their loyalty. That's what the super fans are. And so, and as a result of that, by the way, you see all these other artist discovery platforms that are out there, like SoundCloud, like Audius, like Lalo. Those are all great new companies out there. Uh, companies in the metaverse, Web3 startups. These are all discovery platforms um, around artists connecting with super fans to pay more for premium releases. And I think you're going to see a lot more of these companies and I hope they go public too. So we can include them in MUSQ. So I'm reading the uh, chat and Michelle shocked said that Taylor Swift should record her songs again for a third time. <laughs> well, well, so first of all, we don't know. We don't know that that's really Michelle shocked. It could just be a, a pseudonym, but I am, I love Michelle shocked and. <laughs> Michelle, um, it's really you. Um, yeah. Let's know. But um, yeah, there's actually uh, something that I read that said that uh, Taylor's tour to Australia is expected to keep the country out of recession. And I think there's people that argue that part of, you know, the uh, summer resurgent in the economy has been attributable to the Beyonce tours and the Taylor tours. So it's it's really we're in a very interesting time where the the financial impact of these tours and all the you know, the people that they support. I mean, it's it's just really incredible to think about, you know, a billion yeah. dollars and then all the ancillary uh, spend that occurs occurs because of these tours from well, lodging be, to travel yeah. to all of that. Well, the global, the so we talked about streaming. We talked about the benefit to content. Um, yeah, I mean, live music alone is, is explosive right now, okay? Um, in 2021, it was at 5 billion that that was it was as high as 22 billion it went down to 5 billion and then now it's at at a, close to 40 billion dollars right and all of these artists are having massive impacts in their whether it's you know Beyonce going into Sweden or Taylor Swift having impacts on the economy it's 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 amazing to see live nation just announced i think doubled the amount of artists that are going on tour in the next uh 12 months so, you know, I'm expecting to see a lot more artists on tour and then the trickle down effect to, you know, to communities, to hotels and restaurants and so on. It's exciting to see. And I think the um, artists themselves, they missed playing live. I mean, that's really why they do what they do, right, is to connect with their fans. So, I, you know, uh, I know John Mayer said he was, you know, so the, this is the first time that in a long time that he's really enjoyed you know, touring and really having a good experience because I think when you lose something, uh, you it makes you appreciate it more. So, you know, just to kind of recap, um, where you know, if if an investor wanted to put this in their portfolio, where would it go, and and <clears throat> why do you think people should have this kind of exposure? Yeah. So, and by the look, way, that so, that is yeah. Michelle. Tom said that was Michelle shocked. Okay. In okay. the chat. Michelle, oh, Michelle, I'm so happy you're here. I, I mean, uh, I, I am a big fan. So thanks for joining today. Um, so 
what what did I want to say? Uh, so music is um, where does it fit? I think this fits in 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 any investor's portfolio. It's like one to two and a half percent. Oh, did David freeze? Sounds like he may be uh, locked up there. Um, yeah, let me let me text him and let him know that he, he's frozen. He he's probably aware of it. <laughs> um, um, hey, hey, Jane, I have a question that you may be able to sure. answer. So, as new companies come into the marketplace, you guys mentioned TikTok a moment ago. When it goes public in the U.S., maybe in the next few years, um, where does the additional capital come? for MUSQ to purchase shares of TikTok for the portfolio? Yeah, so a name like that, because it's so influential and it would definitely qualify based on the liquidity and the market cap, um, it would get in you know, pretty much right away you know, at the IPO. And then it just comes from the other weights of the names in the portfolio. So because we're market cap weighted, it would be weighted according to its market cap name up to that 7% uh, cap. So it's not as big as like an Apple or a Google. So it would probably get, you know, a meaningful weight, maybe like one to 2%, but, but that weight would come from the other names. So, so that it, means, that means the fund manager would lighten the load in other areas to yeah. capital to purchase the TikTok. Got it. Yeah. So, and that's the other nice thing about the frequent rebalancing is that you do get to trim some of these names that, that get out of, you know, a little out of whack that maybe um, you know, and you get to kind of top up uh, some of the names that, you know, maybe are sort of the future winners. David, good to have you back. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> I saw you froze uh, there in time. Tom, uh, how are we doing on time? How, how do you feel like we're, you feel like we're covering a lot of ground here? You think with you know, what else we, What else should we talk about today? Yeah, so one, one question that was raised in the Q&A earlier, I'd love to hear you guys address, and that is sort of the downside, if there is such. In other words, you know, some of the investing public that may be listening to this is may, maybe not that sophisticated. Are these guys, are, are they going to get wiped out? Uh, is their investment going to get decimated like it did in 2008? Well, these are none of these companies are speculative companies. Um, just take a look at the holdings. I mean, first of all, the top top twenty percent of the fund is Apple, Amazon, Google, right? So, and then Jane, what are the other top uh, you know top ten holdings there? These are all companies with lar very large market caps. I don't have the list in front of me, but it's Universal, it's Live Nation, it's um, Sony, it's SM Entertainment, it's Sony. So these are very large market cap companies, I think in, you know, in the worst of times in 2000 and, you know, in 08 or in 2020, I think these companies corrected at most, you know, 20% or 22%. Uh, none of these were speculative technology companies like you saw in some of the ARC funds or some, which got, you know, uh, which went down, you know, 40 or 50%. None of those companies went to zero, by the way. So again, like the whole thing here is that some music investments do go to zero, but we want to create something that doesn't go to zero. I think a lot of people are passionate about music and they don't know where to put their money. And they invested in, say, a label that spent all their resources on developing 3X or 5X that didn't go anywhere, or they overspent on marketing and they ran out of money, um, right? It's like there's so many things like that that happen in music because it's illiquid it's hard you know so the whole idea here was to go after public companies that are established and get something liquid and get 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 your money in something stable right and if you don't like what's going on by the way you can get out too for a long time like you were invested in music you couldn't get out i don't i mean i made a lot of investments in music and i was my investment was stuck for years right yeah. uh, in my in my own companies Right. So now this is a completely liquid way to get in and out of the industry. If you're a believer in music, you know, for all the things you're reading about, for all the things we said today, if you think it's a good investment to make, then, you know, we believe this is the way to this is the way to do it. Yeah. And it's obviously not going to be, you know, 100 percent of somebody's portfolio. I mean, people have to um, 
put it in with, with their other investments. But the nice thing about the ETF, again, is it is diversified. So you're buying a basket of companies. Um, you're not just putting all your eggs in one basket, you know, just buying Apple, just buying um, Warner, you know, so it is diversified and that helps reduce the risk as well, which I think is really beneficial, you know, because we don't know, you know, some of these really small companies, they could be 10 years from now, could be, an, you know, the size of an Apple, you, you never know. So, um, you know, it takes some of that that risk and, and uh, away from having to, you know, pick necessarily the winners if you own all all the companies in the in the universe. Well, I think that's a perfect stepping off point. David, I tip my hat to you, man. I think it's really cool what you're doing. Jane, I'm thrilled to know of your business too and all the other cool thematic index funds that you've developed in battery technology and online shopping. So folks, there's other ways you can invest in cool, very definable uh, ETFs via her company. To the audience, you got yourself a treat today. I always love to bring people that are doing really interesting and cool things. And today you got a double dose of it. So kudos for showing up. And with that, I will sign off with my usual sign off. And that is be nice to each other. I'll see you out there soon. Love that. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.